Okay, so we've seen for the one-dimensional particle in a box, this, this one-dimensional particle in a box problem, that the solutions to the Schrodinger equation have this form. Some constant times the sine of some n pi x over a, where n has to be an integer, and x has to be confined to this box we've defined somewhere between 0 and a is what we define to be the, the boundaries of our one-dimensional box. So that's the particle in a box problem. We've arrived at this solution by thinking about what values are allowed inside of the constants inside of the sine function in order to uh, make the function be continuous, but we haven't talked at all about this value of a. So let's see if we can understand what these wave functions look like. So here's a box where x ranges from 0 to a, and I've drawn walls of the box here. The, the wave function is going to be zero only inside, non-zero, only inside this box, representing the fact that we've confined the particle inside this box. So if I take, let's say, the n equals 1 solution, sine of 1 pi x over a goes up, comes down. When n is 1 and when I plug in x, the value of x is equal to the edge of the box, a. So x over a cancels. And if n is 1, I just have sine of pi. And so that's the first time this sine function has come back down and hit 0. So that would be a graph of uh, psi sub 1. If I plug in n equals 2, I'll get a different function. It's still going to be a sine function. It's just going to oscillate twice as fast. So it's going to go down and hit 0 halfway through the box. And then it's going to oscillate back upwards and hit 0 at the far edge of the box. So each of these constants inside the sine function are engineered so that the function always comes back and hits 0, maybe after one half an oscillation, maybe after a full oscillation, maybe after one and a half or two halves or four halves and so on. So each of these wave functions is just a different number of oscillations fitting inside the box. That's the meaning of this uh, constant n. The meaning of the constant a, that's just the a constant that multiplies the entire function. So let's say for this psi sub 1 function, with a particular value of a, we get this function. If I were to choose a different value of a, I can make it taller, or even taller still, or even shorter. If I choose different values of a, so some value of a, or a different value of a, or a different value of a, different values of this constant a just change the height of this function. So which of these functions is, is right? Which ones are wrong? Which, one, uh, which values of a make the function better or worse? Remember, as always, when you're confused about what the, the wave function means, let's go back to our requirement that the wave function squared has to represent the probability of finding a particle somewhere. So again, let's say for this top function, if we have this wave function, I've got a high probability of finding the particle in the middle of the box, zero probability of finding the particle at the edges of the box. With a different a, I, that just changes the size of the probability. But we know I have 100% probability of finding the particle somewhere. Somewhere between negative infinity and infinity, if I add up all the probabilities of finding the particle at all of those places inside the box, I have to get 100%. So, Since probability is equal to the square of the wave function, and since I don't have any complex numbers anywhere, I don't have to worry about the complex conjugate in the square. Squaring the wave function, if I integrate that everywhere, I have to get 1. So that's going to end up being how we determine the value of a. So let's, let's see what that looks like. I want to require that 1 is equal to the integral of wave function squared from negative infinity to infinity. The wave function looks like this in the place we're interested in, inside the box. Outside the box, the wave function is just 0. So this, this wave function that I'm plotting um, is 0 outside the box. So I can break the integral up into three pieces. I
I can integrate psi squared from negative infinity to zero. So I integrate this portion of the curve. The area under this green line when I square it is just going to be zero because the wave function is zero. So wave function is zero. So this whole piece goes away. This whole piece goes away because the wave function is zero outside the box. So the only part of the integral I care about is the part inside the box. And what psi squared looks like inside the box, if psi is this function, psi squared is going to be a squared sine squared, uh, not k, but n pi x over a. And I have to integrate with respect to dx. So that's the integral I want to do. I want to do, uh, let's move that, I guess, over here. I want to make sure that when I integrate, sine squared n pi x over a, between 0 and a, I want to make sure I get 1. There's only going to be one value of a that allows this integral to come out and have that value. So how do we do that integral? Uh, let's, integral of sine squared doesn't look too tough, but uh, to get rid of this messy stuff inside the trig function, let's use u substitution. So if I let u be n pi x over a, so that du is n pi over a times dx, and dx is du. I'll move the a and the n pi to the other side. That lets me rewrite my integral. So I want 1 to be equal to the integral of a squared sine squared n pi x over a. I chose my u so that that n pi x over a would simplify and just become a u. dx has now become a little more complicated. dx is a du multiplied by some constants a over n pi. And because I have a definite integral, I have to remember and, and transform the limits as well. So the integral used to go from x equals 0 to x equals a. Now my integral needs to go from u equals something to u equals something. When x equals 0, if I plug into this expression, if I plug a 0 in here, the value of u is n pi times 0 over a. So that's still 0. When x equals a, n pi times a over a, the a's cancel, and I'm on the upper side, upper limit, just integrating up to n pi. So let's pull all the constants out of this integral. So I've got a squared, a over n pi, and now I'm integrating from 0 to n pi, the quantity sine squared u du. All right, so what do I do with that? Probably, realistically, probably what you do that is ask your calculator what it is or uh, look it up in an integral table, and that's fine. Uh, that will give you the right answer. We can, in fact, uh, let me leave a little bit of room and tell you that, in fact, the answer, if I integrate sine squared from 0 to n pi, what I'm going to get is n pi over 2. And there's a nice reason that's true, so I can draw a picture that will show you exactly why that's true. If I, so the, the quantity I'm integrating is sine squared. So here's a graph of sine squared. So sine squared looks like a sine, except instead of dropping below the axis, it bounces back above the axis because I've squared the sine wave. So here's u. The graph I've drawn there is sine squared of u. I want to know the area under that curve as I go out to n pi. That's what sine squared look like, looks like. It starts at 0 and oscillates from that point on. If I draw, and let me say that's sine squared. If I were to draw cosine squared, that looks very, very similar. It just starts high and oscillates exactly the same, but starts at 1, drops to 0, goes back to 1, drops back down to 0, and so on. So the, the second graph I've drawn there, that's the graph of cosine squared. And we know if I add so cosine squared and 1 squared together, I get 1. Right? That's one of the trig identities uh, almost nobody can forget. So if I add the area under the green curve, the sine squared curve, if I add that to the area under the orange curve, then what I'm getting is the area under 1, the area under this flat line 1. 
So the area under 1, if I go from 0 out to n pi, that's just a rectangle with height 1 and length n pi. So that tells me that what I get from integrating just the sine squared part from just one of these two equal pieces is the, the rectangle n, to n pi divided by 2. So that's a way to remember, if you want to remember how to do this definite integral of sine squared, that's remember, a way to remember how you get it. But again, the answer your calculator gives you is, is certainly just fine. There's some cancellation that happens. n pi over 2, the n pi in the numerator cancels this n pi in the denominator. So we find that what we want to be true is that the 1 on the left side is equal to uh, a squared times a little a over 2. We are solving for the value of a. Remember, we're looking for the specific value of capital A that allows this integral to be equal to 1. So when I rearrange and solve for capital A, a squared is 2 over a. a is equal to the square root of 2 over a. Right. So what that means is that the value of a that we've solved for in this wave function, our actual particle in a box wave function, We know the value of a now. It's square root of 2 over a times sine of n pi x over a with the same requirement that this is only true inside the box and that n has to be some positive integer value. So the process that we've just gone through, taking the wave function, squaring it, integrating it everywhere, and finding the value of this constant out front that guarantees that I have 100% probability of finding the particle at some location, that's a pretty common process that we'll go through anytime we want to find the constant out in front of an integral. But often we don't need to bother to do that. Notice that we got this far without having to discuss the value of a because this value of a didn't change whether or not this wave function solved the Schrodinger equation. Whether I use this value of a or some different value of a, it's still a solution to the Schrodinger equation. It still reaches zero at the edge of the box no matter how large the function is. The only thing it affects is whether the probability integrates to one the way it's supposed to, supposed to. So if I truly want uh, the full wave function, including the value of this constant out front, I need to go through this process, which is often a little bit tedious, to find this constant that we call a normalization constant. This process that we just went through is called normalizing the wave function to find the normalization constant. Uh, so let's. Give that a name. And once I've normalized the wave function, that's a good thing. But if all I care about is, is whether the wave function solves Schrodinger's equation or not, or whether it uh, has the right value at the boundaries of the uh, box, then I don't need to bother with the wave function. So sometimes we'll solve uh, quantum mechanical problems without bothering to think too hard about the uh, normalization constant. So the next thing we'll talk about, normalization, this, this idea of uh, um, normalization, it turns out to be very closely related to another idea called orthogonalization, and that's what we'll talk about in the next lecture.